Let's pray. Father, thank you so much again for your word that never stops to feed us. It never stops to take away our thirst. It's a wonderful word. And so, Lord, we pray that as we open it this morning, that you'd, you'd feed our souls. You'd meet the need of our hearts. You'd address and, and satisfy the deep hunger and thirst inside. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Jonah chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord, and he said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech you, my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth, and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head, to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd, but God prepared a worm. When the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd, that it withered. And it came to pass, when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun heat beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted and wished himself to die, and said, It's better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? He said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for which thou hast not labored. Neither madest it to grow, which came up in a night, perished in a night. Should I not spare Nineveh, that great city? wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. Now, <clears throat> when we come now to the fourth chapter in this book of Jonah, that is, th 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 there's, that, that's all that we're going to see. There's been the conversion of the people of Jonah. Just th This book only has four chapters. And now we're in the fourth chapter, and this is a, this, really this chapter is, is, a, is, a, is a chapter of, huh? This chapter is a tragedy. And I wish that, that last week I could, have, I could have finished the book of Jonah. I wish that there were only three chapters in the book of Jonah. That would have been nice. Why? Be, I wish there was no fourth chapter in the book of Jonah, because if there were only three chapters in the book of Jonah, then the book of Jonah would have been a great Feel good. It would have been a feel-good ending. It would have been so much better. I mean, just think of how wonderful that book of Jonah would have been if the last verse in chapter 3 was the end of the book of Jonah. There was nothing more written. How wonderful it would have been if there was nothing more stated to this history than Jonah 3.10, the last verse in Jonah 3. And we just, and we finished off last week and read, and God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. That would have been great. We would have been so happy if we just could have let the, that verse be our final meditation for this book. You ever watched a kid suck on a lollipop? All right, now that you all have these lollipops, talk about the lollipops, and kids, kids. You know, one thing, kids don't bite into a lollipop and chew it and scarf it down. But what do you do with all, what do kids do? They suck on the lollipop. Why? Because they make it last a long time. Lollipops become like an experience. It's a, an experience, a delightful experience that lasts a long time. And if you ever watch a kid enjoy a lollipop, I mean, how the kid peels off the wrapper, sometimes gets it close to their eyes and for, for putting it in their mouth. And it's that, that closing of the eyes. You know, down in Loretto, we have this taco shop, uh, taco restaurant, El Rey. They serve the most delicious tacos. 
And there's something that people do there, and it's so famous that they've actually made a video about it, is when they, you know, the, Francisco makes the tacos, it gets delicious flavors, you know, coming up there on this big hot plate. And then he, he, he brings it, and people sit there in anticipation and watch their tacos being made, you know, getting hungrier and hungrier, salivating more and more. And finally, when the taco comes, this is typical, they like close their eyes. <laughs> and eat it. <laughs> it's that closing of the eyes where you shut down the windows of the eye window port and, and so that you're not distracted. They do that when they take the taco. They do so they're not distracted. They can just enjoy all the flavors. And a kid does that with a lollipop to heighten the experience of tasting the lollipop. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if chapter 3, verse 10 was our lollipop and we just sucked on it? And we made it last a long time. I mean, let's just imagine that chapter 3, verse 10, forget about chapter 4, I know I'm supposed to preach on chapter 4, forget about that right now. And just think that chapter 3, verse 10 is our lollipop, and we take the wrapper off of chapter 3, verse 10, we close our eyes to heighten the experience of just tasting this verse 10 in chapter 3. We put the lollipop of that verse in our mouth, and the first thing we taste with that Verse 10 of chapter 3 are the words, and God saw their works. And as we suck on that verse 10 of that lollipop, the delight of those words, God saw their works, it makes us happy. It makes us happy as we think, why did God see their works? It was because God was looking at them. God saw because God was looking. What does God, what did, what, what does God saw tell us about God? It tells us that God saw because God was looking and God was looking because God cared. He cared. What a wonderful truth that is to meditate on. God cares. That's a wonderful truth that, 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 that Hagar, a woman in, 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 the, in, in Genesis, a woman named Hagar, she learned it when she and her son Ishmael were in the desert about to die with no water, and God showed her a fountain of water to keep in her and her son alive. And what she said after God showed her that, that life-preserving fountain of water, she said these words, Genesis 16, 13, Genesis 16, 16, 13. She called the name of the Lord that spoke unto her, Thou, God, seest me. For she said, Have I also looked after him that seeth me? But Hagar was so thrilled to learn that God saw her. And she gave God a name. Ata el Roi. You are God of seeing. Because God was looking at Hagar, God saw Hagar's need for water. God cared for Hagar's need for water. And God gave Hagar water. God loves us. God cares for us. God looks at us. We are not the result of in the beginning there was nothing and nothing exploded and we have the perfect universe and somehow inanimate objects came together to make life which somehow over a very long period of time came out beautiful you that is ridiculous and also not true no we are the work of the hands of god and god sees his work and god cares about his work and god loves his work and we are the work of god and so how wonderful it would be in our lives if we put the name that Hagar gave to God on our lips and we said, Ata el Roi, you are God of seeing. How wonderful it would be if we woke up in the morning and the first thing that we said was, you are God of seeing. We now this morning... And what I'm going to need this morning, you're going to see and you're going to care and you have already provided for today. And, I, and what I will need, you've already given because you are God of seeing. Thank you, we should say in the morning. Thank you for being you are God of seeing. And when we encounter problems during our day, problems that are too much for us, 
that we would say, you are God of seeing. You see my need. You care for my need. You love me. You will meet my need. Thank you for being you are God of seeing. And at the end of the day, we would close our eyes and sleep. Before we go to sleep, we would say, you saw my need today. You cared for my need today. You provided for my need today. Thank you today for being you are God of seeing. How wonderful it would be if Hagar's words were on our lips in the morning, throughout the day, and at the end of the day. That would be our first delight from sucking on the lollipop of chapter 3, verse 10, and God saw. And then as we continue to suck on the lollipop, we come to the next delight, which is the next part of verse 10. Verse 10, they turned from their evil way. And we'd be delighted to think of the power of God's word. God's word to the Ninevites was only, chapter 3, verse 4, only verse 4 of chapter 3. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That was the word of God. That word of God was a statement of warning from God. It was so powerful that it brought about a complete life change from the heart in the people of Nineveh. They changed their lives. They turned from their sin of evil. They turned from their violence. They turned to God. All because of that one simple word. This book is full of the simple words of God. Each one powerful enough to affect a change, a dramatic change in our lives. Just as that one little word that Nineveh preached in verse 4, verse 4, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And as we suck further on the lollipop, the truth, and we meditate on Isaiah 55, 11, Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Philippians 2.13, Philippians 2.13 talks about the power of God to change us. Philippians 2.13, it's God which works in you both to do and to will of his good pleasure. David said this, David put this way about the power of the word of God to change us. Psalm 40 verse 8, Psalm 40 verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Thy law is within my heart. Why did he delight to do the will of God? Because his law, God's law, was in his heart. What makes us, what makes us change our want to? This book. This book, the Bible, has the power to get inside of us and work a work that we can't do by ourselves. What a delight to think of how when the word of God that Nineveh was going to just be destroyed in 40 days. When that got into the heart of the people of Nineveh, the power of the word of God made them, made them totally change their lives, stop the violence, stop the evil. And then as we continue to suck on the lollipop of chapter 3, verse 10, we'll be delighted to taste these words. Verse 10, God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them. And with those words, we would really close our eyes and suck out all the goodness of those words as we would say to ourselves, really? God repented? Really? I thought it was only man that repented. How does God really say that? How does it really say that God repented? And we would think of how repentance is an intention to do it's a change in intention. Repentance is an, 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 an abandonment of an intention to do. When we repent of our sins, we abandon our intention to sin. That's what it means when we forsake sin. We walk away and say, not for me, no more, done. And how sweet the truth that in verse 10, that's exactly what God did he walked away from the judgment of destruction of Nineveh and said, not for me. God abandoned his intention 
to destroy Nineveh. Do you know that that's what Christ does? Christ brings for a person God's abandonment to throw that person in hell. God, Christ affects God's change of mind for a person who comes to Christ, turns from his sin, receives Christ as his saving Savior, and, and God says, not going to do it. Not going to judge him. Not going to destroy him. God did not say that he was thinking about destroying Nineveh. God said that he was going to destroy Nineveh. When he said, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. How sweet to suck on those words in verse 10, verse 10, that he had said that he would do unto him. That he, God said that he would do unto them. God said he was going to destroy them. And God said that he was going to destroy Nineveh in 40 days. God did not say, unless Nineveh repents, I will destroy them in 40 days. God said that he was going to destroy them in 40 days, period. And that meant that it was a fait accompli, which means that God said he was going to destroy Nineveh in 40 days, and that was as good as done. And that there was no other options to stop God from doing it. There was no unless, there was no except, there was no if, there was no nothing like that. It was only a shall be. There was only a shall be in verse 4. Verse 4, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown, period. God said that Nineveh had only 40 days left and then Nineveh was going to be wiped out. And the delight for us in verse 10 of that lollipop verse is verse 10, God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them. God changed. When God saw that the Ninevites changed, God changed. And as we suck out that sweet truth, we really wanted that lollipop to never end. And finally, as we continue to suck on that lollipop of verse 10, we would come down to those words, the last words in verse 10, verse 10, and he did it not. What a sweet truth. God did it not. You know, words are cheap. Words are cheap. Anyone can say anything. That's what always gets me about the beginning of the Bible. It says, God said, let there be light. Anybody can say, let there be light. I can say, let there be light. It's the next part of that verse that's astounding. And there was light. <laughs> I can say, let there be light. There's no light. But he said, that's where God says, that's the wonder of the end of verse 10. And he did it not. He did it not. When Elizabeth saw Mary and knew that Mary had been told that she's going to give birth to Jesus Christ, Elizabeth said to Mary in Luke 145, Luke 145, Blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Elizabeth said there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. That meant Mary was told, you're going to give birth to Jesus Christ. And Elizabeth said to Mary, those were not empty words. Those were words that were going to happen to her. And the sweetness of verse 10 is that not only did God say that he changed his mind and would not destroy Nineveh, but that God followed through and there was a performance of those things that God said he would not do. And all of that comes as we suck on those sweet words in verse 10. He did it not. And as we suck on the lollipop of verse 10 with the words he did it not, we meditate on God's other promises in the Bible like Hebrews 13, 5, Hebrews 13, 5, he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we put verse 10 and we extend our sweet thought, oh, he did, he did not leave us. He did not forsake us. John 14, 2, John 14, 2, Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And we extend verse 10, and our sweet thought is, and he did make an eternal home for us. 
John 14, 3, John 14, 3 says, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And we extend verse 10. And our sweet thought is that there'll be a day when we're in heaven and we'll say, and he did come again, and he did take us to himself, and we are where he is. John eleven twenty five. 25, John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And we extend verse 10 to a sweet thought, and we say, when there's going to come a day when we're going to be in heaven, and we're going to say, and he is to me, the resurrection and the life. And I did die, and I am still alive. That's how sucking on the lollipop of chapter 3, verse 10, puts a tremendous smile on our face like it does for kids with a lollipop. Such a sweet lollipop is chapter 3, verse 10. Lasts a long time. It's been so nice. So nice if the lollipop of chapter 3, verse 10 were the last sweet words we had to end this book of Jonah. We would have just loved it, the book of Jonah just ending with the words, and God... In verse 10, it would have been so great if the book of Jonah just ended with the sweet thoughts about God, about his mercy, about his, uh, abandoning, his attention, abandoning his attention for judgment. That's what we want. But sadly, the book of Jonah does not end there. Sadly, we've got another page in the book of Jonah. Sadly, there is a chapter 4 in the book of Jonah. Sadly, chapter 4 pulls the lollipop right out of our mouths. Sadly, chapter 4 is all about Jonah, not about God. Sadly, verse 1 of chapter 4 is not about Jonah glorifying God. Sadly, verse 1 is about Jonah seeing why he thought God was so bad. Sadly, verse 1 is about Jonah being so angry that the Hebrew reads he was blazingly angry. He was glowing like red-hot coals with anger against God. Chapter 4 is a chapter where Jonah is infuriated at God. And it's really sad. And it sort of ruins what could have been a really nice, sweet ending to the book of Jonah. So chapter 3 tells us that, uh, that, that God was angry with Nineveh. And God was blazingly furious with Nineveh to the point where God was ready to destroy Nineveh, like he did Sodom and Gomorrah with fire from heaven. Chapter 3 tells us that God abandoned his anger. Chapter 3 tells us that God had a sword of judgment in his hand, ready to use it to destroy Nineveh. Chapter 3 tells us that because God saw Nineveh repent, that God threw down his sword of judgment and walked away. Chapter 4 is telling us that Jonah was blazingly angry with God for doing that. And it was like Jonah was said to God, what are you doing throwing down your sword of judgment? It was like Jonah was running over to God's sword of judgment on the ground. It was like Jonah was picking up that sword of judgment and trying to put it back in God's hand while saying to God, you should not have thrown down your sword of judgment against Nineveh. Take it back into your hand. Regain your anger against Nineveh. It's very bad what you did when you threw down your sword of judgment. Put this sword back into your hand and use it to destroy Nineveh. Don't be a sap. God, in his love and care and mercy, he abandoned his anger toward Nineveh. But Jonah, in his sour, rotten hatred, became angry with God. That was something. Jonah, the servant of God, becomes angry with God because God abandoned his anger toward Nineveh. Jonah's a prophet. He's a prophet of God. He's a servant of God. He should have followed God and adopted God's love and care and mercy toward Nineveh, but he did not. Which gives us an insight into how this hellfire and brimstone preacher named Jonah did his job in verse 4. In verse 4, when it says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh should be overthrown. When Jonah cried out his preaching message of verse 4, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown, Jonah kind of preached it like this. In forty days, Nineveh will be destroyed, and I'm going to love it. 
In 40 days, Nineveh is going to be wiped out, and I'm taking a front row seat with popcorn in my hand, and I'm going to love to watch Nineveh get annihilated. There was just no brokenness in the heart of this man over the judgment of Nineveh like there was in Jesus Christ over the judgment of Jerusalem. When Jesus Christ said in Matthew 23, 37, Matthew 23, 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under, his wing, under her wings, and ye would not. Like he said in Luke 19, 41, Luke 19, 41, when Jesus was come near, he beheld the city of Jerusalem and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they're hid from thine eyes. The days shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, <clears throat> compass thee about, keep thee in on every side. They shall lay thee even with the ground, thy children within thee. They shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. He cried. There was no tear in Jonah's eye in verse 4 of chapter 3 of Jonah Chapter 4, verse 3, when it says, He cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. There was no spirit of Jeremiah in Jonah when Jonah preached the judgment of destruction of Nineveh, like there was with Jeremiah, who said in Jeremiah 9 1, Jeremiah 9 1, Oh, that my head were waters, and mine eye was a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Jonah's eyes were dry. Jonah preached judgment was coming to Nineveh. Jonah's heart was not broken when he cried out that Nineveh is going to be destroyed in 40 days. What a difference there was between Jonah and Jeremiah, which brings to us a searching question for each one of us. Which one am I? Am I a Jonah or am I a Jeremiah? Which one are you? Are you a Jonah or a Jeremiah? Do we even care to tell the lost that hell is waiting with an open mouth to swallow them down if they refuse to come to Jesus Christ? When we tell the lost, is there a tear, is there a Jeremiah tear in our eyes? Or a Jonah, you deserve it, dryness in the eye. Jonah was on fire, angry with God. And when Jonah became angry with God, Jonah, Jonah totally invalidated his mission and his life work and his life purpose. Why? Jonah's name in the Hebrew means dove, which means that Jonah's life work was his, Jonah's life mission, Jonah's life purpose was to be a dove and bring peace with God. That's what our life work is to bring peace of God to others by bringing them Jesus Christ. Because Ephesians 2.14 says, Ephesians 2.14, He is our peace. Romans 5.1, Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jonah was angry with God in verse 1, Jonah was denying his life work, his purpose, his mission in life. God did not create Jonah to be a messenger of hellfire and brimstone. Jonah only brought that message of hellfire and brimstone in order to persuade the people to find peace with God. Jonah would fulfill his purpose, his mission in life, as he brought those who heard him to peace with God. There was no great destruction of Nineveh in the book of Jonah, but there was a great destruction in the book of Jonah, and that great destruction was of the life work and the life purpose of Jonah. That was a terrible destruction. Jonah's name does not mean destruction. Jonah's name means dove, peace with God, not war with God. The problem with the history in this book is that the history is not all about God and his goodness. This history is soiled because it's a history about Jonah and how far Jonah was from God. Just think of it. Jonah is God's prophet. This history is about how bad one of God's prophets, Jonah, was. Could have been a beautiful history of only being about God 
his wonderful mercy to man as shown in the mercy to Nineveh. But instead, this history is all about Jonah's terrible, spoiled, brat-like attitude. Jonah got in the way of God's glory. If the message of Jonah brings nothing else to us, then let it be. It's our pride, arrogance, stubbornness, judgmentalness, anger that will get in the way of God's glory. Jonah was the one who needed to change. He's the one who needed to repent of his anger against God. He needed to, 1 John 1, 9, 1 John 1, 9, confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jonah needed to repent. Jonah needed to change. But instead of changing, Jonah in his rotten stubbornness boldly stood up against God in verse 2, in verse 2, and he said, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before thee unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, great kindness, repentance of the evil. Verse 2 says, Jonah prayed. And that brings us right back to the, when was the last time we heard Jonah praying? Oh, Jonah prayed in, in chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 1, yes, we remember in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Jonah prayed. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord. He heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Those are the only two times in the book of Jonah where we read that Jonah prayed. Once from the fish's belly, when Jonah was in great trouble, and once here in verse 2 of chapter 4, where Jonah, Jonah prayed to complain to God. Nineveh has repented and changed. What about you, Jonah? Your turn. And that tragedy in the book of Jonah is that there's not a third time when Jonah prayed. The tragedy in the book of Jonah is that there's only two times when Jonah prayed. And it would have been so great if this history would have just had a third time. When Jonah prayed, if only we could have read in the book of Jonah that Jonah prayed the words of Psalm 32, 5. Psalm 32, 5, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my heart. If a person is not willing to do that, it's a tragic, it's a tragedy of life. If a person is not willing to say, I acknowledge my sin to God. I am not hiding my awfulness to God. I will confess that I am a sinner to God. That's the key that unlocks the door of God's forgiveness, of God's no, remembering the sin no more, dropping sin into the depths of the sea. That's the, forg that's the key to let's be friends, God says. But tragically, there's no record of Jonah praying that kind of prayer. Tragically, the last prayer in this book is verse 2. I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? With those words, Jonah was saying, I did not then agree with God, sending me to show mercy to Nineveh when I was in my country, and I still not do, still do not agree with God showing mercy to Nineveh. That statement in verse 2, this Jonah saying, I did not change. That statement in verse 2 is Jonah saying, I have not changed, I will not change in my life. And that's amazing to us. That's amazingly horrible to us because this history in this book is all about change. Nineveh changes by walking away from all their evil and their violence. Nineveh changes by hating their sin. And showing they hate it because they stopped eating and drinking and wearing sackcloth. They started to wear this very terrible clothing. God changed by saying he will not do the destruction of Nineveh that he said he was going to do. God changed by not doing it, the judgment of Nineveh. Everyone is tremendously changing in the book. It's a wonderful book. Change, change, change. That's all we see. Nineveh is tremendously changing in their lives before God. God is tremendously changing in his intention to destroy in judgment. Everyone's tremendously changing. Book of Jonah is a wonderful book. Nineveh changes because Nineveh is not stubborn. Jonah doesn't change because Jonah is stubborn. Jonah tremendously does not change. 
And not only does Jonah stubbornly say in verse 2 that he hasn't changed in his attitude toward the Ninevites, Jonah justified his past sin. He tried to in verse 2 when he said, Therefore I fled before thee unto Tarshish. What Jonah is saying there is that I was right all along to have run away from God. Jonah's justifying himself. Jonah's telling God that, that, that Jonah's telling God, Jonah's saying, I was right. You were wrong to have caused me to go to the Ninevites. And when we read this, we shake our heads and we say, what? What is Jonah saying when Jonah said, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before thee unto Tarshish? What is he saying in chapter, chapter 4, verse 2? From what he just said in verse 2, what does verse 2 mean about Jonah? That, that, what, what does verse 2 teach us that Jonah learned about that whole storm in the sea incident? What does verse 2 tell us about Jonah that what he learned from falling from, from the lot, when they, they choose who was responsible, from the lot falling on Jonah, exposing him as the problem on the ship? What does verse 2 mean? about what Jonah learned from being thrown into the sea? What does verse 2 mean about what Jonah learned from being swallowed by the fish? What does verse 2 mean about what Jonah learned from being three days in the belly of the fish? What does verse 2 mean about when Jonah learned from being vomited out of the fish? Most importantly, what does verse 2 mean about when Jonah prayed in all of chapter 2, which was Jonah's prayer, what does verse 2 mean about when Jonah said in Jonah 2.9, Jonah 2.9, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. The sad truth is that chapter 4, verse 2 means that Jonah learned nothing from the storm at sea. Nothing from the lot that exposed him. Nothing from being thrown overboard. Nothing from being swallowed by the fish. Nothing from being three days in the fish's belly. Nothing from being vomited out of the fish. Nothing. Because Jonah did not change. Verse 2 shows us that Jonah learned nothing because Jonah was stubborn. And stubbornness comes from P-R-I-D-E. Pride. All that happened to Jonah was the mighty hand of God on Jonah, and, Joan, and, 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 and God put his hand on Jonah just like God put his hands on us, and he wanted Jonah, and he wants us to respond to his mighty hand, and God's response that he's looking for is 1 Peter 5, 6, 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Change under the mighty hand of God. Stubbornness is a refusal to humble ourselves. And Jonah refused to humble himself under the mighty hand of God. Storm at sea, lot exposing him, being thrown overboard, being swallowed by a fish, being three days in the fish, being vomited by the sea. Jonah held on to his own stubbornness and he refused to change. And we can see God saying, I don't know what more I can do. What more can I do to persuade Jonah to humble himself and change? We can see God saying, I custom created a fish to swallow and hold him for three days and then vomit him out. If that's not enough to make Jonah change, I don't know what else I can do. My prophet is hopelessly stubborn, God says. And we can see God saying, Jonah has watched Nineveh change. Jonah has watched me change. Why can't Jonah change? Stubbornness is a refusal to change. Stubbornness is pride. Humility is the opposite of pride, which means that humility is to change. When verse 1 says that Jonah was angry with God, that means Jonah had an argument with God. Jonah had a contention with God. And the Bible says about contention in Proverbs 13.10, Proverbs 13.10, only by pride cometh contention. Poor God. He's got a really bad prophet. He's got a prophet full of pride. You know what we all need to do? We all got a lollipop. We all need to sit down and write God a sympathy card. We just say, we're really sorry. We feel, we feel very badly for you. You got such a bad, proud prophet. 
He's getting in the way of your mercy, of your grace. What does verse 2 mean about Jonah's prayer and promise? When Jonah said, I'll sacrifice unto thee, Jonah 2 verse 9, Jonah 2 verse 9, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay my vows, salvations of the Lord. It means that Jonah didn't mean it. He said it. It means that Jonah was not sincere when he prayed it. It means that Jonah only said it because Jonah was scared and in trouble in the fish's belly. And he had no, unchange, no intention of changing his heart attitude. It means that Jonah was a phony. And he only said what he needed to do to get out of the fish's belly, just like people in prison today who, who get born again to get out. Jonah said what he needed to say to get out of the fish's belly, and Jonah did what he needed to do. Jonah did not change in his heart, and that made his prayer phony. And Jonah did not change because he didn't know God. Because he, he didn't change because he didn't know God. He knew God very well. In verse 2, chapter 4, verse 2, he says, I know thee that thou art a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, repentance of the evil. Yes, he did. Jonah knew God to be full of grace and mercy. Jonah knew that God was all about grace, which is, which is giving people what they do not deserve. Jonah knew that, gra that, Jonah was, that God was all about mercy, which is not giving people what they do deserve. Jonah knew that God was all about giving people time to repent. Jonah knew that God is all about being kind to people. Jonah knew that God loves to abandon his intention to judge and destroy. And Jonah just wanted all that about God, that grace, that mercy, that time to repent, that kindness, all that just for Jonah. He just wanted it for himself, but nobody else. He was a real Calvinist, that Jonah was. Jonah wanted to say, all oh, that grace and mercy, and that's only for the elect of me, and the Ninevites are definitely not part of God's elect. Jonah has reached the height of refusal to change when he says in chapter 4, verse 3, chapter 4, verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. This was so frustrating for God to hear his prophet tell him that it was better for him to die than to change. And love what God loves? God says, I love it when people change. Luke 15, 7, Luke 15, 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. The question is, how is God going to deal with his prophet Jonah, who is just set his feet so it's firmly dug and stubborn refusal to change the spoiled, brat-like, rotten attitude. And God asked Jonah a question gently in verse 4. Verse 4, then said the Lord, doest thy will to be angry? Is that really what you, are you doing well, to be angry? With this question, God is asking Jonah, can you take a good look at yourself and see how you look as an angry man? Just look at your anger. Is it really good for you to be angry? It's so amazing for us to see God being so gentle to try and reason with Jonah by asking Jonah, Jonah, take a look at yourself. Hold up a mirror. All that anger. Is that really who you want to be? And Jonah doesn't answer God when God asks the question. Jonah doesn't answer God. What does Jonah do? It says, the record says he goes outside and he gets a seat. Good viewing position, verse 5, verse 5. Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There made him a booth and sat under it until the shadow to, till he might see what would become of the city. Jonah's hoping that after 40 days, God's going to change his mind and, and destroy Nineveh. And so Jonah's got himself a front row seat. He says, I want to see it. I don't want to miss the destruction of Nineveh. Jonah's going to, and, and, and Jonah's ready to clap and cheer if God changes his mind and decides to destroy Nineveh. Instead, God makes a plant to shade Jonah and then God made a worm to destroy the shade over Jonah, and Jonah got angry over that. Instead of being grateful for the shade, John, Jonah's angry for the worm that destroyed the shade that Jonah had no part in making. And again, God tried to work with Jonah, and so God asked Jonah in verse 9, verse 9, God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? He said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. God's running out of options. He's running out of options of how make, to make Jonah see how unreasonable, how headstrong and stubborn he is. Finally, God asked Jonah, okay, all right, Jonah, 
There's 120,000 children there. They don't know their right hand from their left hand. They know nothing. You really want to see them destroyed? Oh, maybe you don't have a heart for children. Jonah, there's a lot of cattle. What do they know? You want to see them all killed too? I wish I could tell you that the book ends with something else, but that's the last words of this book. It's sad. It's a sour note on the stubbornness of a prophet. May we not be like him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for what we do see of you. So patient, kind, loving, instructing. Help us not, Lord, to make you unhappy. In Jesus' name, amen.